Well, that was wonderful, and uh, tonight uh, we're going to continue worshiping God and hearing from Him in various ways. The theme for this evening is crossing cultural barriers, and uh, many of you know that, uh, and you're involved in, that one of the things that we're learning most is how do we have the courage and the skill to cross cultural barriers to do effective ministry. And it reminds me of a Korean pastor that I met not too long ago who was sharing about his coming to America and his dad, you know, trying to get him all prepared and, and excited. And finally, you know, he said, I'm ready to come. And he said when he got off the plane, there was three things he was really excited to uh, experience in America. Number one, because he was coming to Southern California, was Disneyland, right? So he couldn't wait to go see Disneyland. And uh, some of you all I know uh, were thinking about sneaking away to Disneyland and all. We're glad you didn't do that, okay? But the second thing he said that he wanted to experience was eating a Big Mac at McDonald's, you know? He was all excited about that. And, uh, and then I wish he was here to tell this himself, but he said the third thing that he, he wanted to experience is that he, he was absolutely sure that when he got off that plane, he was going to meet Wonder Woman, you know? Because he said that on tele, you know, Korean television, it was all, you know, Wonder Woman shows with subtitles, and he, and he was sure that he was going to meet her, you know, as soon as he got off that plane. Well, I don't know if you've ever been disappointed trying to cross cultural barriers, okay? But tonight we're going to get some clues as to how to do that in a more effective way. And to help us get our evening off to a great start, we've asked one of our board members, Sister Yancey, to come up and pray for us and uh, open up our time. So, Sister Yancey, would you give her a great hand as she comes up? Praise the Lord. God is good, isn't he? Still in the blessing business. You know, there's a song that's been on my heart. I can't sing, so I'm not going to sing it. But I would like to say the words. We're together again, just praising the Lord. We're together again on one accord. Something's great is going to happen. Something's wonderful in store. We're together again on one accord. Did you know that? Something's great is going to happen. I see Matthew's down there. Something's great is going to happen. Something's wonderful in store. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come thanking you for grace and mercy and for your many, many blessings. We thank you for what you're doing in CCDA. We thank you for what you're doing in the individual lives of each and every one of us. And in our organizations, Lord, we thank you that we're able to see life-changing stories. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we realize and understand that the same mind will bring about the same results, and changed mind will bring about changed results. We thank you so much for that, Lord, because of who you are. You are a great, mighty, awesome God, and we want to give you all the praises and all the glory for all the things that you are doing, will do, and continue to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, and thank God. All right, turn to your neighbor and say, what are you going to do about it? All right, we're going to continue to consider what we're going to do about it, and we're going to be inspired tonight. Right now, it's really my privilege to introduce uh, our first uh, speaker of the evening who's going to just share a little a bit about his ministry about the great things that God is doing in his life and through uh, their, uh, the Dream Center and Angelus Temple, Matt, Matthew Barnett. Uh, it's a great ministry right here in Los Angeles in a hospital that they bought and rehabbed. Let me just tell you a few things about this ministry. Over 200 uh, different ministries are flowing and working in this church to meet the needs of people all over this community. 42 services a week. Okay, are offered to help spread the gospel and preach the good news in 10 languages, okay? Over 6,000 attenders, and that many children are involved in their Metro program as they reach out to kids. So we're really excited to hear from uh, Pastor Matt Barnett 
we're going to see a little video to give you a picture of that ministry. And as soon as that video is done, I want you to just uh, uh, welcome uh, Pastor Barnett as he comes. So let's look at this video and then hear from Pastor Barnett. Pastor Matthew Barnett had a dream to build a 24-7 church that never slept. A place that could meet the physical and spiritual needs of a hurting community 24 hours a day. Eight years ago, that dream became a reality. Now, reaching over 30,000 people locally, with over 40 services every week, and with over 200 outreach ministries, the Dream Center, not only changing the face of the inner city Los Angeles, there are now over 130 Dream Centers around the world. Whether in Europe, or at Joyce Myers Dream Center in St. Louis, the needs of hurting people are the number one priority. The Dream Center was made possible by nothing short of a miracle by God and faithful, committed, and diligent volunteers and supporters. The Dream Center houses over 400 volunteers, workers, and hurting people on the road to recovery. With only a quarter of the facility remodeled and brought up to code, just only imagine the impact that will be possible once the other three quarters of the building is complete. The Dream Center has truly become the model of what can take place by networking both the church and the community together to effectively change a city. President George W. Bush visited the Dream Center and he claimed it is an example of what can happen to a community and a nation. The results are simply overwhelming. Thousands are filling the auditorium multiple times every week. Literally, thousands are being saved every single week. A revival is taking place that has produced the greatest opportunity of all. We must finish the floors at the Dream Center. It's not enough to simply pray with them at the altar. We must also care for them daily and nurture them back into becoming a productive part of society and assume God's plan for their life. The Dream Center sincerely thanks you for your prayers and for your support. Thank you very much. What a privilege it is to be here, and thank you for that wonderful choir number. Wow, that was amazing. And thank all of you for allowing me to be here tonight. I'm so privileged and honored. And uh, when I was 16 years of age, I had a dream to come to Los Angeles and pastor a church. I was the least likely person to have that dream. I came from Phoenix, Arizona, and I uh, grew up in a middle-class community. But at 16 years of age, God spoke to my heart that someday I'd be in Los Angeles pastoring a church. I never knew when it would take place. I thought maybe when I was 50 or 60 or 70, you know, God would open up the door. But at 16 years of age, God called me, and at 20 years of age, He opened the door for me to come into the inner city of L.A. and pastor a church. I'll never forget when I first got to the church, there were about 15 to 20 members in my congregation, and all of them were over 65 years of age. So in one week, they're going from a pastor who was 82 years of age to a pastor that was 20 years of age, all taking place in one week. So you imagine the challenges that I had the first week I got there. The first thing I did is I came from a big church of 14,000 members in Phoenix, so I was used to kind of, you know, making changes quite often. Because my dad's kind of a cutting-edge guy. He's 65 years of age, and he likes classical music. He likes rap music. I mean, he likes everything, you know. Anything that has a good message to it, he likes. And so I'm kind of used to going with the flow and always evolving and changing. So I decided that I'd take the, uh, the, the piano and move it from one side of the stage to the other my first week. That was a big mistake. I lost half of my 15 members the first week because I moved the organ from one side of the stage to the other. And man, it was tough. I lost half my church. I was so discouraged. And I tried everything. And finally, a lady in the church came up to me and she said, Pastor, let me tell you what you've got to do. If you want to build this church, there's people all over this city that used to come to this church. If you do all the traditional religious programs that we have done for years, all the lost sheep will somehow come back to the church in the inner city. So I was willing to try anything at that point, you know, after the great church reduction in the first six months. You know, I can write the book on how to grow a church, from, uh, to reduce a church from 15 down to 7. And uh, so I decided I'd listen to them. And 
I try to do everything. I try to put the plants in the same place that they used to be, and I moved the organ on one, the back to the stage where it belonged, and I tried everything I could to try to get people into my world. I tried everything to set my world so beautiful, thinking people would come in. I did all the traditional Sunday school programs I grew up in, but people were not coming into my world. And one night I looked out after trying to build a traditional church in the inner city, and there were only two people that showed up in my church. I was so discouraged, I went home as a 20-year-old preacher, and I wept in my pillow at night, and I said, Oh God, I'm a failure. Maybe you, your anointing was on my father, but maybe it's not on me. And I went home, and I wept, and I sobbed, and I said, Oh God, give me a word that will encourage me. And God spoke to my heart, a word that really wasn't encouraging. He said, I want you to get up right now, and I want you to go to Echo Park in downtown L.A., so God, for God to tell you to go to Echo Park in the middle of the night, it's a pretty bold word, you know. So I decided I had nothing to lose. I was already dead anyways. I'll go down there and give it a shot. And so I went down to Echo Park, and I walked around the street. And that night as I walked down the street, I looked, and I saw helicopters flying over the sky looking for criminals. And I looked over the street, and I saw a bunch of gang members up against police cars and getting beaten down. And looked down the street, I saw a homeless man that was stumbling out of a bar in the middle of the night drunk and as he passed out in an alley I walked through the streets and it was like God was giving me an illustrated sermon that night on what he wanted me to do and he said the problem is that night he spoke to my heart he said you've expected people to come into your world he said quit expecting people to come into your world and start putting yourself in another man's world from that day on, God changed me. I went back to my church, and I said to my secretary, I'm doing everything different. I said, we need to move my office outside of the church. She said, what? I said, outside. So every day I'd be out there studying, and as I was studying, all the mamas would bring their little boys to school. And on the way to school, I learned to speak Spanish just by talking to everybody in my neighborhood. I didn't know anyone, and I, I was the only white kid within five miles of any direction, you know, in my community. And so I just decided that I would just get to know people and forget about the world I came from, and ever looking back of going back to Phoenix. I went home, and I ripped up all my postcards that remind me of home, and I started to suffer for Jesus. I started to go to all the different restaurants in the city just to get to know people, you know. I went to the Korean barbecue restaurants. Oh, glory to God, I'm getting hungry. Let's just go home and forget this service right now, you know. And all the Mexican restaurants, you know, it's just suffering for Jesus. And all of a sudden, I decided in my mind, that my world would no longer be my world. I was going to put myself in another man's world. And I wasn't going to leave that city until God built the kind of church that he wanted to build. The church began to grow and things began to take off. And we began to adopt all the streets in our neighborhood. Two people would take a block and serve the people in the community. And now we have 700 people every Saturday that go out every single week and adopt all the streets, making 32,000 home visits every Saturday. Not preaching to people, but just knocking on doors and picking up trash and painting out graffiti and bringing food to those that are hurting and just serving the people in our community. There's all those times where it felt like the dream was dying. You see, there's some times in your life where you try to hold on to a dream. And after a while, you hold on to it for a while, but then there comes a transition where if you entrench yourself into community, you don't have to hold on to the dream anymore, but the dream gets a hold of you, and it won't let you go. Things begin to happen. We start opening up our little old building at the time that we had for, for the community. Every single day would open up, and families would come and would give food bags away, and Every square inch of our building was used to serve people in our community. We bought 16 houses in the neighborhood, and we put people from drug and alcohol and rehabilitation programs in there, and we start giving them discipleship and mentoring and ministering to people in the community. And God began to do an awesome work, and we began to see gang members getting saved, and we bought houses and started rehabilitating them, and we knew that the Lord was doing something special. When one day I was driving off the Hollywood Freeway, and I saw a big old hospital, the old Queen of Angels Hospital, right off the 101 and, and Rampart area, and I saw the hospital and went in there and talked to the uh, Catholic church and owned it, uh, some Franciscan nuns that, that were in charge of it, and we sat down and talked to them about a price, and the building was about $16 million at one time, and we told them we didn't have that much money, but we told them our dream that God gave us. And to our surprise, they said, you know what, this building was $16 million, but we like your vision. We'll sell you that building, 400,000 square feet, 1,738 rooms. They said, we'll sell it to you for $3.9 million. 
you have 18 months to raise the money. Well, that's the good news. The bad news is there's no way in the world we had $3.9 million to raise. We went back to our church, and back then we only had about a few hundred members, and most of them were all homeless, you know, from the streets. And uh, I had a church vote. It was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. A lot of these guys didn't have a penny in their pocket. I said, we have a $3.9 million dream to buy this building. How many of you are interested in buying the building? Now, these guys had nothing to lose. Like, Amen, brother, you got my vote. I had a 300 to nothing vote, man. These guys had, how many here know sometimes it's good to have guys with nothing to lose on your team? They won't steal the vision, the dream God gives you. So we started raising the money, preaching all over America. When finally, I, I, we started, tried everything. We didn't have the money after about nine, nine months. We thought that maybe that the dream God gave us was dead. And that maybe we just stepped out in crazy faith. And maybe this is not what God had for our life. We didn't have the money, but we started reaching the hurting and reaching the poor and ministering to runaways and prostitutes that we bring into our place and rescue them off the street away from their pimps and take them into our place and rehabilitate these runaway, throwaway kids on the streets. And doing all the 200 different ministries and the 7,000 kids that come to Sidewalk Sunday School every single week that we have children's church in the middle of housing projects with guns and flying over, people, planes flying over and gang members on every street corner. All we kept on doing is reaching out, but we still, we can only pay the interest. We need $3.9 million. But one day I get a phone call from a man, and he's, he's the most negative man. He, in fact, he was the guy who told us, if you come to L.A., I will never support you guys again. He told my dad that in Phoenix, in the church I came from, because he didn't believe it was God's will for us to come to L.A. And so he called and said, I'm in town for business. Can I talk with you? And the first thing that came to my mind is, I don't want to show this guy around. This negative old man is going to discourage my vision. But finally, he said, well, I'm just around the corner. I want to come. And as a preacher, I tried everything I could to get out of it. You know, every excuse, but I couldn't. So he decided to come, and I showed him around the building. And all of a sudden, this man's heart was breaking. He said, you know what, Pastor, my dream for L.A. is I thought the only way to reach L.A. was to drop a bomb on the city and start all over again. Because I feel that L.A. was the problems for all the problems in America start from this city. He said, but when I walk around this place and I see the teenagers in rehabilitation, I see the 500-plus residents that are living there every single day, coming off drugs and alcohol, and the volunteers from all over the world that give a year of their life. He said, I believe that God can save this city. He said, Pastor, will you forgive me? And when he said, will you forgive me, this businessman, he pulled out his checkbook. He said, Pastor, will you forgive me? He wrote out a check for $1 million, and he gave me that check. And I said, you are forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son. I'm looking for holy water, anything, you know, to throw on this guy. And he said, I got a son. He's got as much money as I do. Do you mind if he comes? I said, I'll pay his ticket. How about right now? Bring that guy over here. And his son gave us a million dollars. And then a man from Malaysia came over who heard about our dream. And he was a billionaire. And he said, I'm in town buying all the Laura Ashley stores in America. I said, oh, sounds like you really don't have anything going on. But uh, he said, I want to give you guys $500,000. And in a matter of 30 days, $2.5 million came in. And I began to realize something. When you start reaching out to the poor and the hurting and the afflicted, and you give your life towards those they have nothing to give you in return, God from heaven sees any vision on any kind of level, and God will meet the need of any work that's ministry and caring for the poor. The Bible says, he who lends to the poor, he who gives to the poor lends to God, and he will repay what he has given. And I tell you, God will invest in any vision that's reaching the poor. You see, there's a time in my life where I used to dream of having a big church. And God's given us several thousand members, but I don't think about that anymore. All I think about is the individual out there every time I preach. The stories that come. There's a time where I, all I cared about was success. And I don't, I've died to that dream a long time ago, but lived to the dream of getting up every morning and serving this generation the best you can. The first day I came to L.A., I closed with this story. There's a young man that was shot and killed in a drive-by shooting, and his body laid on the steps of our church. This is my first day to L.A. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And I came into my church, and there were only about 10 to 12 members at that time. And I sat down, and I talked with them, introduced myself as a new pastor. But God checked my spirit. He said, no. I want you to stand up to these people and challenge them to go across the street to that family that lives in that apartment attached to the liquor store, and I want you to minister to that family. I, I asked them if they'd come with me next door, and all of them said they don't feel like God had led them to go and visit. And I said, well, come on, let's just go anyways. 
And finally, they wouldn't come, so I took up an offering. As most preachers do, you get turned down for volunteers, so you receive an offering, you know. And I, they gave me $38. I put it in my pocket, went across the street, knocked on the door, the little apartment attached to the liquor store, and the door opened. I couldn't believe that the door flung open. And I was staring in the face of the biggest gang member I'd ever seen in my life. He looked down at me, and I looked up at him, and then I looked up at God and said, God, I've always heard there's a place called heaven. Save me a place because I'm coming home real soon, you know. He said, what do you want? I said, I've come to pray for the family and give the mom money. And he stared at me, and after a while, I, he let me in. I walked in, and I gave her the money, and I was out the door. I'm not like David Wilkerson. I'm not going to get in there, and I'm not going to preach a sermon. I'm giving her the money, and I'm out the door, you know. And as I'm heading through the door, an arm, gra a hand grabbed me on the shoulder and spun me around. And again, I'm staring in the face of the biggest gang member I've ever seen in my life. Now, you've got to understand, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, the most middle-class community, golf club, country club in America. The only gang members I'd ever seen in my life were those little well, white kids that walk around in the mall that their mom drops them off in a Mercedes outside the food court, you know, by your local mall, and they walk around with the saggy pants on, you know, and their hat, hat on backwards, and then mom picks them up outside the food court in about an hour, the gangsters for a day. I mean, that's the kind I'm used to seeing. But, man, this is a real Slim Shady. I mean, this is a real guy, you know, and... Uh, and I'm walking around, and he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him. And I got out of there, and all of a sudden, as I'm walking out, the hand grabs me, spun me around. He says, Padre, I want you to do something for me. Now, I'm a pastor. I'm not a padre, but if he calls me a padre, he's, I'm the padre. You know, I'm not going to argue with him. I said, yes, my son, what would you like? He said, Padre, I want you to do something for me. I said, brother, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll rub your feet. I'll rub your back. I'll order you beer. I might even drink it with you. Just don't kill me, you know. He said, I want you to stay, and I want you to pray. I got to the center of the circle, and I joined hands with all these gang members, and I began to pray, a wimpy prayer. You know, one of those star book for minister prayers that you memorize? Lord, bless this habitation with your glorification and your manifestation. Flood this place with every Asian I can think about. You know, I was praying. And halfway through my prayer, God spoke to my heart. He said, you're praying like a wimp. Pray like you really mean it. And I said, God, I pray that because of what happened today, that young kids can walk down the street and not worry about getting hit by a bullet. I pray that these kids will realize that only you control life and death. And you are the controller of all things, God. I pray these kids will repent and they'll get their life right with God and they won't live this way anymore. And all of a sudden, to my prayer, my hand was getting squeezed next to me tighter. And I said, God, I'm going down. But if I pray hard enough, I might get my name into the Fox's Book of Martyrs. And I, oh, God, you repent. And I started, I started naming sins that they were doing that God didn't even know that they were doing, you know. <laughs> At the very end, all of a sudden, I felt my hand getting squeezed next to me tighter. I said, God, I'm going down. I thought I was going down. And all of a sudden, my hand was being raised in the air to the right. My hand was being raised in the left. And every single one of these big, tough gang members on my first day in L.A., I stood in the middle, and I, I led them in the sinner's prayer. And every single one of those men accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior on that day. And I had the best bodyguards in the city of L.A. My car never got broken into from that day. What I'm trying to say to you today is this. If you want to be happy, if you live your life with palms up, you're only going to be happy at Christmas time and your, your birthday. But there's a way you can be happy 365 days a year, living your life for others. You'll never be the same again. What I'm telling you is to die to your dream of success. You live to your dream of being significant in the lives of people. God will do more in your life ever seeking success. You just lose yourself in the needs of others. And God will build what he wants to build. God bless you and thank you for letting me share tonight. I'm so proud of what God is doing amongst all of us here. If we work together, we can make an impact in this generation. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this time together. I pray that the power of your spirit would fall upon everyone that's here tonight. I pray, Lord, that you will give them power, not so that they can attain or gather, but give them power so they might serve. For you, Lord, do not get a, give us the anointing to have a good time or to get goose pimples or to feel good about ourselves, God. You gave us the anointing to break the strongholds of the enemy, to break the strongholds of poverty, to break the strongholds of this world. And I thank you right now, Lord, as I'm speaking, that your Holy Spirit is speaking to people's lives and they are being challenged and impacted to go out 
and make a difference, Lord, and to start dying to themselves and living to others. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, um, Pastor Matthew. What an encouraging word of what God can do as we give our lives to Him. You know, uh, I think there certainly is a, uh, a, a, a really special energy in CCDA, and we're reviving ourselves and being out here in Southern California with people are here. It's such a fantastic time, and the local host committee, and you met Andy and many of the others that have been a part of this, have done such a fantastic job. And uh, we've been thanking them, and we are so thankful. But we also have uh, a, a national staff that have been working hard. And our national director uh, for the conference, I just want many of you know her, but I would like to just have her stand, and I want us to thank her for the last year she's been working on putting this conference on. And that's uh, Mrs. Sharice Dower. Sharice, would you stand right where you are? And let's thank her for her hard work and uh, the energy that she has had. We have other, uh, we have actually four other staff people now in CCDA as the Lord is blessing us and guiding us. And tomorrow at our association meeting, I hope that you will come. Um, every one of you, there's some confusion. I've talked to probably 10 or 15 people today that told me, well, I'm not a member of CCDA. Oh, yes, you are, because it's built into your cost of coming to the conference. And instead of giving you a break next year on the conference, we give you a 50% reduction in your membership fee. So the conference, if you pre-registered, was $100, and then you spent $25, which, so you paid $125, and you paid $25 to be a member of CCDA, which is a 50% discount on what the cost of CCDA is and the membership, because it's normally for an individual $50. And so you are a member of that, and we encourage you to come out tomorrow for our association meeting, which will be during the time of our normal focus group and networking time from 11.30 until 12.30. Uh, you know, you can go out and put your little card in. What's the name of the... Uh, Bank of America, uh, and you put your business card in there or something, they draw your name, you have to be present at the association meeting, but you get $500 to give to the charity of your choice, which I think most of you would be your local church, of course, or your ministry. And so you certainly can do that, and we look forward to that. You can meet all of our other staff members then, but I do want to let you know, too, and we'll talk much more about this tomorrow. In fact, he is going to lead us in our time together uh, in the association meeting, but we have done an 18 months search for an executive director to be full-time to run the organization and to take all the visions and dreams that our wonderful board and all of you have and make it something that's really working. And God has blessed us with a fantastic person, and he has got all the skill set. When, when our committee interviewed him, they said, this guy is a slam dunk. And I would like him to stand. He's in the back. He's kind of bashful. He's bald. He won't, his name is Gordon, but he doesn't look like me, so you won't get us mixed up. But Mr. Gordon Murphy right back here. Stand up, Gordon, and let's thank God for Gordon Murphy and all that he's already doing. Now we're going to leave the Dream Center and go to the other side of the world. What a privilege it is for us to have as a member of CCDA a Coptic monk. Father Bashoy El Antony is from Cairo, Egypt. And he's a part of a monastery, the oldest monastery in the world. He has started in Egypt, amongst the poor, CCDA Egypt. This is his second conference to be with us. He's been a part of CCDA for over four years. But let me tell you how God told him to work with the poor. Father Beshoy, he's, a, he's, a, he's kind of a computer nut, and so he emails me back and forth regularly. And every year, right before Easter, about two months before, he says, Wayne, if you want to talk to me or say anything, you've got to say it now, because for the next seven weeks, I'm going to be in a cave, and I'm going to be fasting and praying. He goes up into the mountain, and he prays and fasts and listens to the Lord for seven weeks to prepare for the celebration of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, before then, he had spent months and months in prayer in a monastery. He does this continually regularly. But when he was in the monastery, 
God spoke to him and says, I want you to leave the monastery and I want you to go live among the poor and I want you to make a difference in the lives of the poor people of Cairo and all over Egypt. He lives in a Muslim country where to be a Christian is very difficult. So he brings a wealth of experience to us and it, it's my privilege to not only introduce him to you tonight but to call him my friend. Please give a warm Welcome to my good friend, Father Bashoy L. Antony. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, when God Amin. In fact, Wayne asked me to tell you in brief. Uh, about the relationship between Christians and Muslims in Egypt. The relationship between the Muslims and the Christians is varied. And to the degree that it is varied, it has a strong impact on Christian community and its development. It must be noted that Egypt was a Christian country since St. Mark, the evangelist and the apostles who brought the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ to Egypt in 62 AD. Egypt had been more than, uh, had, uh, more than 30 million Copts when the Arabs invaded Egypt in the 7th century. The Arabs invaded under the saying that of bringing peace to the Copts as this was their land. When the Arabs arrived in Egypt, the Romans fled. Meanwhile, Copts had nothing with which to protect themselves or their land. Most of the Coptic men became slaves and their women became servants. After a period of time, the Islamic prince imposed special taxes on Christians called Gizya. The Copts paid those taxes even when they held high position or were uh, landowners. The burden of these taxes was very heavy and Christians had to resort to one of three choices. Pay the high taxes, become the Muslim, or be killed. Many Christians were killed and some converted to Islam. The result of this was that Christians became poor because generation after generation had to pay these special taxes, which forced them to sell all their properties to maintain their Christianity. As example, we can mention here a few things to clarify to you what happened in the 10th century when the Muslim ruler forced Copts' mothers to stop talking in Coptic tongues and sent his spies around their houses. The result was thousands of Coptic mothers' tongues had been cut so that they use Arabic language by force instead of the Coptic language. Also, Copts forced to wear dark clothes, which after a few decades they take take it away, but clerical men refused to do so because they were intended to show their Christianity among Muslims. My friends, I'm proud, I'm proud of my robe that shows my belief in our Lord Jesus Christ. This is one of the ways that evangelized the Muslims in our country. As the political situation between the Muslims and the Coptic community De deteriorated, so did the economic situation of the Copts too. An example of opposite extreme is what happened a few years ago when the, last, uh, the former president released Muslim terrorists from prisons who then began to hunt down Copts. The situation became very intim uh, inti uh, intimidating and because many terrorists forced Copts to pay the jizya taxes for fundamental Muslim group, this had a bad impact on their economic and commercial situation. 
Islamic tourists burned cops alive in front of their families, burned their shops, and slaughtered them in broad daylight. All that had severe impact on poverty and homelessness. Many cops emigrated to the poor areas in, of Cairo after having enjoyed wealth and power in Upper and Lower Egypt. Although the situation is different now, there remains much to be discussed. The evil thoughts about the Copts that filled Muslims' minds during the last two decades still have an impact on the economic situation of Copts. There are other things that affect the economic situation of Copts in an indirect way. For example, there is no informational benefit to Egyptian Christians on television or in radio except for broadcasts on Christmas Eve and Easter. While Islamic programs, on the other hand, are numerous and daily. There is no one in whom Christians can confide or to help them find jobs. Many Muslims, business owners, when look for to hire someone, state explicitly that Christians are forbidden, making the situation even worse. Furthermore, Christians have no permission granted to build new churches or even to repair or restore parts are falling down. On the other hand, when it comes to Muslims, anyone can turn one of his house room into a mosque where people can gather and talk as they wish. Christians were until recently viewed as the keepers of knowledge and wisdom. They were university professors and scientists of the state. However, during the last few decades, a storm of, a challenge, of a challenges faced those Christians so that a large majority emigrated and now there is only few university professors left who are Christian. The university's Muslim professors who are uh, the present majority try to stop excellent Christian students from following a university career. This is particularly clear in the faculties of medicine, engineering, and other important faculties. Currently, there is no authority that can prevent this bias against Christians. Therefore, the future of Coptic children, their income as adults, and their position in community will be heavily affected as a result of all what I mentioned and other things. The Christians in Egypt are becoming poorer, thus affecting their Christianity too, because they force it by condition to convert to Islam, to find a job or place to sleep or any other needs in their lives. As Christians, we try hard to find the proper solution to our problems, and sometimes we manipulate the bad circumstances, and most other time we find a solution through our Christian love to other people. But the problem that we are presenting here is the relationship between the Muslims and the Christians affects the economic and social situation of the Christians and its individual. And now, what are we going to do about it? Pray for us and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Father Beshoy. You have two minutes left, so uh, that's wonderful. Way to go. What are we going to do about it, right? What are we going to do about it? Sister Yancey is going to join us again to take our offering for tonight. Okay, how are we doing tonight? You know what? I, glorious. You know what I want you to do, really, on a serious note? I want you to just think about what you have learned from CCD8. How many of you have learned something from CCD8 this conference time? Come on, you guys. 
Amen. Now, you know, we can't put a dollar to what we've learned from CCDA. But what we can do, we can reach into our pockets and just to show gratitude, just to let CCDA know that we're in their corner. You know, there's some of us that's here and might not have paid, but you have your opportunity now. And we will appreciate that. So right now we're going to take an offering. And I want all that have to give. Feel free. If you don't have it, then that's a different story. But for those that have, feel free to give. Okay? Okay? Amen. Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity to give. And we realize and we understand that if we would give, it would come back to us. Good measures pressed down, shaken together, and running over. We thank you so much for the opportunity to give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.